Welcome everyone to another week of the Experimental Math Seminar here at Rutgers. Uh, this week our speaker is Professor Sui Hong Chen from Rutgers. He's going to talk to us about sorting probability for young diagrams. Thank you very much for that, As usual, please mute yourself unless you have a question. Thank you. Okay, yeah. So thank you very much for the introduction and also for the opportunity to speak here. So today's talk is a joint work with Iker Park from UCLA, who is also in the audience, and with Greta Panova, who is from USC. So let me start today's talk uh, with a story about my sister. So my sister is a big fan of anything Disney. In fact, she told me that she wants to visit this December, not because she wants to see me, but because she wants to go to Disneyland. Okay. And uh, the upper list here, this is the list of characters that my sister liked from Frozen. Order from the least liked to the most liked. And the bottom one is also from Disney. This is from the Mickey Mouse series. Again, ordered from the least like to the most like. And one day I got curious. So I went to my sister and asked, hey sis, which one did you like better between let's say this uh, Olaf and Mickey? My sister think a little bit and as I said, hmm, it seems like I actually like Olaf a little bit. And then I keep my interrogation. Okay, how about this uh, Uncle Scrooge and Elsa? How about Princess Anna and Minnie? I kept my integration, uh, I kept my integration, and after a long day, I finally managed to figure out that uh, this is my this is the list of characters that my sister liked from the least like to the most like. Okay. So this interrogation is uh, actually a form of sorting under partial information, which is what motivates today's talk. Okay, so the six character that we saw just now, we can think of it as a partially ordered set, which is a set, let's say, uh, so today we are only dealing with finite stuff. Today, everything is finite, okay? It's a set with a partial order on it. So for example, in this picture, it's a set of four elements, A, B, C, D, and an arrow from A to B means that A is less than B. So by this logic, it also means that A is less than C, B is less than D, C is less than D, B and C are incomparable. And it's important to say that from this picture, you can know, you will know that A is less than B, right? Because by transitivity, even though I don't draw the arrow from A to B. Okay. And a linear extension, which is what we are very interested in today, is a completion on the partial order. So for example, in this process, there are two ways to make them into a complete ordering. Either A is less than B, less than C, less than B, or A is less than C, less than B, less than B. Okay. Uh, okay. And now let us uh, see, let us look at the real life problem that can come up from doing this linear extension. So suppose that you have a friend who is working for a bank. And just like all other capitalist system, you want to order people from the richest to the poorest. And what your, let's say that your friend has an end unknown customer, you don't know, uh, and your friend wants to order them from the richest customer to the poorest customer. What he can do at every time step, at every step, he can choose any two people. Let's say choose between A, uh, let's say C and B. He can go and ask his boss, hey boss, who is, who is richer, C or B? The boss can say that, hmm, customer C is richer, but the boss is not allowed to tell your friend how much money they have how much money C or B has for confidential reason, okay? And your friend is, uh, by doing that, his job is to figure out who is the richer, uh, from the richest to the small, to the poorest. And let's say that your friend has done the job, he's doing a pretty well job, but maybe let's, for today, he needs to leave the job early. Maybe he needs to uh, go and buy groceries. So he transfers the job to you. And let's say that he already figured out that, oh, customer A is, Less than uh, is less than B, A is less than C, D less than F, and so on. And your job is to complete this task. How would you do that? How would you do it efficiently? So let's say that for the first step, I go and choose C and B. I go to the boss and ask, and the boss tell me that oh, C is less than B. Okay, that's first step. Then after that, I go okay. How boss? How about D and E? The boss tell me that D is less than E. Then I continue. I ask him, uh, how, how about C and B? He tell me that C is less than B. 
And at this point, I claim that we are already done. So even though we have not figured out other arrows, this information is actually enough to figure out that the list, uh, the, uh, the, the, order, the right ordering is A less than C, less than B, less than B, less than E, less than F. You only want to find one of them, not all of them, right? Uh, actually, I want to find all of them. I want to know from the, the reaches to the progress, like, like ranking number one, all, ranking number two. You, you want to construct all the linear extensions? Uh, oh, so, uh, uh, yeah, uh, no, I only need to construct one linear extension. Okay. Only one, yes, that's a good question. Thank you, Dohan. Yes. So for this particular uh, question, it took me three steps to figure out the list. And now the question is that, how can we do this efficiently? Not only for this example, but for all process in general. Okay. And here is a strategy proposed by Kit Lissin in the 1970s. He said that, okay, at each step, suppose that you can always find X and Y. X and Y such that out of all possible linear extension, roughly half of them is X is less than Y, and the other half is Y is less than X. In this situation, no matter what you do, at every time step, you will always reduce the number of possible linear extensions by one half. So that means that if you keep doing this again and again and again, you will have already gone through everything. You will already end the job when you spend around log number of linear extension. Okay. And in fact, you can show by uh, some kind of, uh, by some similar argument that this number is actually optimal, that you cannot do better than log number of linear extensions up to a constant. Okay. So now the only the so now the question that this uses is that. To reduce us to find this element x and y, do they even do they even exist? Right? And one third to the conjecture say that the answer is yes, they always exist. And furthermore, the claim is that the right constant, the right probability that you put on the left hand side and right hand side is one third and two third. And that is why it's called the one third, two third conjecture. So this conjecture is uh, widely is, is believed to be one of the biggest conjecture, if not the biggest conjecture in the order theory. In fact, it's actually the first, uh, if you open the Wikipedia, you look at the open problems in order theory. This is the first one that come up in, the, in, in your search. And at this point, some of you might, might have a question, maybe you're just too shy to ask that, hmm, Sui Hong, why is it that you, you choose the constant one third and two third? What is so special about that? Well, this is because suppose that we have this process where uh, you are, uh, have three elements. This, uh, this is the sum of two process plus one process. And for this particular process, you can check by calculation that the probability that x is less than y is exactly one third, and the probability that y is less than x is exactly two third. So this means that if the conjecture is true, then this, this result is the best possible for all process. You cannot improve anymore. Okay. So up till here, are there any questions? Feel free to- Yeah, uh, I have a question. Uh, yes, this is a very question. small example. And maybe you can make the bounds tighter if you restrict to larger posits. Ah, uh, that is a very good question. So maybe this is only something that happened for a small process. So there is actually an example. What you can do is that you can take this, uh, let's call this uh, P1. You can do this uh, chain of P1 plus P2 plus P3 and up let's say plus pn and by by some i mean that i declare that p1 is less than p2 less than p3 and so on and for this example this uh, this number is the one that two track so just oh, so you, you, you can make up examples with very large exactly numbers. yes okay yeah. however that is still a very good intuition in fact uh later in this talk uh we will see that maybe one third two third is just an intuition that there may be maybe rather uh there's a way to say that you know maybe the bond can be improved, but thanks for the good question. Yes. Any other questions so far? Okay, so let me continue. So let us see what is known so far about one third two third. And a big breakthrough was made in 1984 by uh, Kahn and Sachs, who are actually also the Rutgers. They showed that, yes, uh, this probability is bounded away from zero and one. And the number that found is 
3 over 11 and 8 over 11, which is roughly between 0 0.273 and 0 0.727. And this bound is applied, uh, the way they do it is actually very beautiful. What they do is that they uh, use this thing that's called Alexander Fanchal inequality from the mixed volume, in the, which is like from uh, geometry. And they use it to say something, uh, to get some kind of log concavity on probabilities of cosec. And from that log concavity, you say it turns out it is uh, enough restriction that you get that this number must be bounded away from zero and one. And this result was uh, improved 10 years later by Brightwell, Fastner, and Trotter, where they show that uh, the number is roughly between 0 0.276 and 0 0.724. And what is interesting about this bound is that this bound cannot be improved for intimate cosec. In the sense that, uh, so this is a bit uh, tricky, but so there's a, uh, there's a way to define this probability even for intimate cosec, even though you, you cannot uh, sample, things in, uh, sample things randomly anymore, at least because these are infinite stuffs. And they show that this constant is actually tight there. That, that means that one third to the conjecture is false for infinite cosecs. So in particular, actually, that's one reason what makes this problem so hard. Because somehow, you need to find an argument that fails for infinite process, but, on, sorry, but fails for infinite process, but only works for finite process. But that's okay. a little bit surprising, because <laughs> if you make something very, 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 very big, you think in the limit, it should converge. Mm -hmm. So it's not a counterexample? Uh, so, uh, yes, it yes. Uh, very strange, because yeah, actually, it that's a good question. The limit of finite things. So, mm -hmm. yeah, so it that's actually. Yes. Yeah, so Dorman asked, uh, that's a very good question. So, yeah, I would say that it's because, uh, in a way, infinite process, you, they, how they construct it is that it is a limit of finite process, right? And it turns out that this limit does not always well defined. So, they only restrict themselves to the space where this limit is well defined. And for this smaller space, then this limit, uh, that this bound is tight does not mean that actually that, that the reason why happened that happened is because you're actually looking for a smaller for a smaller pool so if your pool is larger then this constant might actually be uh that this I, I, sorry that, I think that 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 is the reason i think one of the reason why this thing got, got tighter for infinite process because you restrict yourself to a more special class thank you yes thank uh, any other question no okay if there are no questions then let us continue and here, uh, now we know this question is hard, which is why as a mathematician, if you see a question that's too hard, let us try to do something a bit easier. Let's try maybe some special cases for now. And the special case that I want to talk about today is something uh, is the process that comes from Young diagrams. Okay? So in Young diagrams, the elements are all of those green cells over here, okay? uh, all of these green boxes. And by Young diagrams, it means that the first row will always be longer or at least as long as the second row, at least as long as the third row, and so on. So this means that I'm using English notation. In the, if you are going to France, they are actually drawing this the other way around. Okay. And here I want to, def uh, I, I need to define partial order. So I say that a box X is less than box Y if Y lies to the southeast of X. So this means that the, this box over here, the top left box, is the unique minimum element of the process. And the maximal elements are all of the box at the border. Okay. And uh, one good thing about this Young diagram, the reason why it's so special, the reason why it allows us to make the problem easier, is that the linear extension of this process, they correspond to the standard Young tableau of the Young diagram. Where standard Young tableau, it is a filling of number for uh, of this uh, of this box from one up to n, so that all of the rows the numbers must be increasing, and all of the columns must also be increasing. Okay. And in particular, this is good news for us because number of standard Young tableau that thing can be counted by this thing that is called the hook link formula, which I will talk about in a minute. But before I do that, are there any questions? Okay, good, let us continue. And here is what is known so far about Young diagrams. Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, 
also as Hesegan has proved that yes, one third, two third conjecture is true for Young diagram. And in fact, they even tell us not only that it's true, they tell us how to find this element X and Y. So Austin Sagan say that either X is the second box in the first row and Y is somewhere in the first column or the dual. X is the, sec uh, is the first box, sorry, it's the second box in the first column and Y is somewhere in between the first row. Either one of these two cases will give you X and Y, they get one third and two thirds. And the proof is, uh, they, they prove this by uh, using this uh, linear, uh, what we call the linear method for Poset. But today, what I want to do is to present an alternative proof, a new proof of this result by using this new algebraic tool that's called the Naruse hook length formula. Okay. And before we go through this hook, the Naruse formula, which is the new one, let us see the classical one first which is the, uh, the, the hook link formula, the classical hook link formula. This formula, the job it's doing is that it counts the number of standard young tableau. So it counts the number of linear extension. And the way they do it is that you first need to count the hook length of every cell. Hook length, this is the number of boxes that is right below the box, to the right of the box, and the box itself. So for example, this top left box, the hook length is seven. There are, because there are three boxes below, three boxes to the right, and counter itself is six, three plus three plus one is seven. You do the same for every box, and then you take the number, you take n factorial divided by the product of hook lengths, you get your number of linear extension, which in this case is 2970. So this is the classical form. And now let us move to the, to the Naruse form. The Naruse form, it did the same thing. It count the linear extension. But what it did is that rather than counting for Young diagrams, it counted for this thing called, called the skew Young diagrams. By skew Young diagrams, I mean that I take the Young diagram, I remove some boxes in the top left. So in this picture, I remove these three boxes that I put the black color. So that means that I eat them. I do not allow them to exist anymore. Okay. And uh, for the classical formula, remember that the hook length formula is just a one giant product formula. But for the Naruse form, you actually need to sum over this thing that we call the excited diagrams, okay? Here is how they are defined. At every step, you can move any box, any one box to the southeast direction. So for example, this box, I can move it to south direction to get this box, to get this picture. And when I do this, I need to follow two rules. First rule is that the boxes, the black boxes cannot leave the green diagram. So that's why you see that all of this picture, all the three boxes stay there. They do not leave the, the, the uh, they don't leave the green diagram. The second rule is that the boxes cannot move if they are blocked by other boxes. For example, in this picture, for this diagram, the top left box cannot be moved down because it's blocked by the, the this black box behind it. That's why there's only one allowed move for this particular diagram to this other diagram. And by doing all these moves, uh, all of these five, all of these five diagrams, they are all excited diagrams. Okay. And my Naruse formula will be summed over all these diagrams. Exactly how is the following. The number of linear extension for the skill diagram is equal to the product formula that you see for the hook, for the hook link formula, for the classical one. Sum over all excited diagram, the five pieces that we saw before, weighted by the product of the hook lengths of the black cells. Okay. We'll see an example soon. So for now, let me just uh, stay, like, uh, stop here for like five seconds. Okay. So here's an example. So in the, in this, in the particular skill diagram, there are five extended diagrams. The hook length for each box is written inside, uh, is inside in here. So by the Naruse formula, the sum will be over the 2970 from the previous slides. Sum over all these five numbers. These numbers are the hook cells of the of this diagram. And I get the number is 1062. Okay. So this is how the Naruse formula works. And one important, actually, one useful fact about this Naruse formula is that notice that every term here, they are all positive. They are all non-negative. This is useful. 
because there are many other formulas for skill yang to count the standard yang table for skill yang diagram, but all of them involve some negative signs. And that uh, and the fact that this is all positive will really help us when we do probability. Up till here, are there any questions? Is everything clear or do I go? Um, uh, if everything is good, feel free to do this thumbs up. Okay. Yes, I saw a lot. I saw people are happy, so let me continue. Okay. So now let me use this result to prove the theorem of Olson and Sagan that I promised you. And the strategy is as follows. Fix your element X. And now your Y will be, you choose it by moving along the first column. Okay. So Y is, y, uh, is moving around the first column. I look at this probability that X is less than YI. And as I, uh, one important thing about this probability is that at the very beginning, what is the probability that x is less than y1? Well, it is equal to zero. Because remember, y1 is the unique minimal element. So everything else is smaller than it, not greater than it. But as you move down across the first column, from y1 to y3 to y4, until you go to, let's say, uh, y5, when you, exit the, when you exit this thing, this probability increases from zero up to one. one by that, I mean that I make an assumption that let's say that this box is greater than everything else, okay? And I will write that the, every time I make this increase, the growth of this probability is what I call pi, uh, is, is what I call P, uh, pi. So there's a probability that X is strictly between yi and yi plus one, okay? And suppose now, suppose you know that this, we need to prove this, but suppose that you know that all of these PIs, they are all less than one term. Then what you can do, then what you can do is the following. When this number increases, you wait until the first time your probability exceeds one term, right? And then when you make the jump, because remember, all of this jump is less than one term. It means that you must jump inside this interval between one third and two term. And that is when you get your probability, when you get this bound that your probability is between one third and two term. So is everything clear? Like, does everybody convinced now? If you can prove this, then we are done. Then we, then we prove the one to the conjecture. Good. Okay, seems like everybody, um, okay, seems like everybody is happy. Let me continue. So now let me prove that all of them is less than one term. And let me do it for, uh, for the first one first. So suppose not, suppose that P, P, uh, P1 is greater than one over three. There are now two possibilities. First is that if P1 itself is between one third and two third, then remember- so it, uh, Please remind us, what is P1? Ah, P1 is uh, by definition, uh, it's actually the probability that X is less than Y2. Okay. That is the definition. In general, uh, let me write it here. PI is a probability that, uh, uh, X is between uh, YI plus, between YI and YI plus one. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, you're welcome. Thanks for the question. So if P1 is between one third and two third, then we are done. And if P1 is greater than two third, here is what I, went, here is what I did. Remember in the beginning when we say that either X is the first element the first row or in the first element the first column, right? You can always do this substitution. You can either go for column first or go for row first. In case that P1 is greater than two third, we just switch them. When you switch them, it goes from greater than two third to less than one third by some calculation, by doing some duality. So from this argument, you can see that we can always assume that P1 is less than one third. Now, the second step, I need to show that the rest is less than one third. How do I do that? Well, rather than proving each one of them separately, I simply show that this sequence is in fact decreasing, that P1 is greater than P2 is greater than P3 and so on. And the way, and let me just do it for P1 greater than P2 because the rest follows by using the same argument. So by definition, if you think about it very carefully, 
E1, the probability that X is between Y1 and Y2 is exactly the situation where in your standard Young tableau, one is the, 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 in the standard tableau, number one appears in the first box and number two appears also in the first row. That takes some kind of a uh, that takes some time to understand uh, to understand. So let me give you some time to meditate. Five seconds. By the same reasoning, P two is exactly the number of Sanya tableau divided by total number of total number of the all uh, all Sanya tableau, where number one is in the first row, number two is in the first column, number three is not in the first row. But if you think about it, these two numbers is exactly counting the number of standard tableau by removing all of these boxes where the numbers are already declared. So this is exactly the same as counting the number of standard yang the number of skew yang tableau, the number of skew yang diagrams. So the number of tableaus of the skew yang diagrams. And that's good because remember, we already have the narrow set formula to count this thing. So let us do that. Let us use the narrow set formula, count P1 and P2. And remember that by the, by the narrow set formula, this number, both of them, will be the sum over, over these excited diagrams with some multiplicity. And now the secret recipe. The nice formula that turns out that once you make this expansion, there is not only a proof, but it's actually an injective proof. You can show that uh, you can find an injective function sending every all of this extra diagram from the first row, uh, sorry, from the second row to diagrams in the first row, uh, counting multiplicities. Okay. And once you do that, then you can say that, okay, everything is done. P1 is greater than P2. Okay. And now, if you just think very carefully, you put everything together, you realize that, oh, that is actually a complete proof. That actually show that, yes. Your probability is between one third and two third, and therefore prove the conjecture. Until here, are there any questions? Yes. So, is this proof simpler than the original proof? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, is the question is that is the is this simpler? Uh, I would say that they are pretty close, more or less, more or less the same, more or less simplicity. But this proof comes with an advantage, which is that it can be improved. It actually will give us a better constant for this one and two term, which is actually what I will say in the next slide. Thanks for the, thanks for the very good predictions. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to, uh, if it, let's go back to the proof example. And remember that by this, uh, by the proof of Olsen and Sagan, it says that, oh, uh, the right, you can, uh, the one possible choice for X and Y, maybe not the best choice, but at least one choice, is the x is the is the second element in the first row, y is the second element in the first column. And if you choose these two, you notice that this probability is actually around 0 0.4848, which is actually closer to one half than one third and two third. Right? So this suggests that rather than just aiming for getting one third and two third, maybe for maybe not for all percent, but maybe at least for young diagrams, we can do better. Maybe you can do something where both the upper half and lower half that they match. That means that both of them are actually closer to one half. Okay. And more precisely, here is a way to actually quantify this. What we are interesting, what we are interested in is the sorting probability, which is where I look at the difference between the probability of x less than y and the probability that x uh, that y is less than x. I sum, uh, I take the minimum of this, uh, of this probability over all possible X and Y in the process when X and Y are incomparable. In particular, you can show that by definition, that your probability of X and Y, they will be very, very, very close to one half uh, if this delta, if this delta P, if this solving probability is very, very, very close to zero. Okay? And that is our goal. We want to show that this sorting probability is zero. And uh, in fact, uh, by the way, we are not the first people that to realize that this number is important. In fact, this actually has been realized by uh, 
uh, has been by Jeff Kahn and Sachs in their breakthrough paper. And they conjecture that this sudden probability actually goes to zero as the width of the poset goes to infinity. So width of the poset, this is the largest size of anti-chain of the poset. In the case of Young diagram, this is simply the number of rows in your diagram. Okay. And so far, the only result, uh, the best result for this direction, in fact, is the only result. So that's mean that by definition is the best, is the result by Comlos, who is again also a member of Rutgers University, where he showed that yes, this probability uh, does go to zero when the number of minimum elements is of the size of around n over log 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 n. And in particular, if your minimum elements, they also form an anti-chain, and therefore the width of the poset also is around n over log 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 n. Okay. So this is one result when the width goes to infinity and the sorting probability goes to zero. And today, in this talk, we are going to do the opposite extreme, which is that we show that this probability can still go to zero even when your width is fixed. Sorry, that will be, uh, yes, question, Jen? Yes, I, I mean, in what sense is this sorting probability a probability? I mean, I, I, I think if we, within some, some class of posets, the sum of the delta p's is one, is that clear? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's actually a good question. Uh, let's go back to the definition. So yes. the sorting probability is a, is a bit unfortunate, but sorting probability is actually not a probability. Okay. They are the difference of two probabilities. Right. So the name is a bit misleading. I'm really, uh, yeah. So it's not Thanks. that you can you can define some class of postsets so so that this function actually becomes a probability distribution. Ah, uh, right? yeah, no, that, that that's not the case. All right. Yes. Thanks for the clarification. Okay. So yeah, our goal is that we want to show that this probability goes to zero even when the width is fixed. What we mean is the following. Suppose that now you have young diagram, let's fix the width. So this fix the width of the poset. And I also need to assume that the last row is at least of the length of epsilon of n. So this is a some technical, technical conditions and it can, it can probably be dropped. We can show that yes, this sorting probability, not only that it goes to zero, it actually goes to zero at the speed of at least square root of n. And uh, the proof ingredient here is that it's two things. First is that we need to use the narrow set formula that we have seen from the Orson and Sagan. And the good news is that because it's using narrow set formula, it allows us to put in another component, another ingredient into this proof, which is the intuition from random law. Here is what I mean by that. So remember that before, uh, when we do it uh, in, with Austin and Sagan, what they do is that they fix X to be the second element in the first row, while Y is in the first column, okay? What we do is that we change our choice. Rather than doing X is second element in the first row, you can actually improve. You can actually improve if you choose X to be the midpoint of the first row. That is actually a better choice. And the intuition is given by comparing this to the simple random walk, where fixing it to the second element is like asking for the random walk to come back to zero at the second step. While putting it at the midpoint is asking for the random walk to come back at the end step, at the, sorry, n over two step. And that allows you to go from constant order to one over square root of n. Okay. More precisely, actually what we do is that we can actually write this something probably B, Remember from before, we can write it as a sum over these many uh, skew diagrams. And then the random walk actually tell us that on this big sum, you don't need to sum over all of them. You only need to sum for the special one that is likely to be bigger. That is what the random walk tells us. And after that, we do many calculations. It's, uh, it's actually a rather technical paper, but we finally can, after, after from here, you can do uh, things simplify and at the end, we get this square root of n. So that is the idea, that is the intuition, that is the strategy. But before I 
proceed further. Are there any questions? Yeah, the square root of n, is it sharp in general? Or you don't know? Is it, uh, that is an even, that is a very good question. Is this, is this thing sharp? And our answer, uh, the answer, uh, the answer is no. We do not believe that this is sharp. In fact, we believe that the right value, at least for all POSEP, should be around C over C over N. That this thing can be improved. But the square root of N is a limitation of the method. And in fact, to actually show that this is really something that can be improved. We actually proved for a Catalan poset that this, uh, that this number, for this very special poset, not for all poset, this number is actually, uh, wait, sorry, n to the power of minus 1.25 is even better than, is even better than one over n. And for this one, and for this for this case, you, you believe it's sharp or you, you know it's sharp? Uh, and yes, we believe it's sharp for this one. Okay. Yes, and let me explain what is the poset first. I, let me just go back to the previous slide. So Catalan poset, this is a special Young diagram when you have, uh, the Young diagram is a rectangle with two rows. Okay. And what is so special about this poset, the reason why it's called Catalan poset, is that the, remember the linear extension or the standard Young tableau of this diagram, it can be connected to the up down lattice path, where if number one appears in the first row, this means that the first step is up. Number two appear in the first row, you also go up. Three is not just in the, is appear in the second row. So this number go down rather than going up. And you keep following the strategy. So you go up if the number is in the first row, go down if the number is in the second column. You keep doing that. And this path, you see that it will always uh, start at zero and at zero. And because it's a young diagram, this number is always above the x-axis. The number of such path is the famous Catalan number, one over n plus one over n plus one, two n choose n. And I'm sure everybody's familiar with it because you are actually here. I believe that you, uh, because you, I mean the, sorry, the password for this talk is the 20th Catalan number. So I assume everybody, I presume everybody knows very well what that number is. Okay. okay. So, uh, every question so far, like does everybody understand what is the process and what is the result? Okay. Uh, if, okay, if everybody's happy, then let me answer Doron's question. So here is the, we use computer, we use simulation to graph the value of the exponent, the number that we saw before. So this blue, so this blue curve, uh, sorry, my, so this blue curve is the exponent. And our previous result means that the we eventually as n goes larger and larger this blue graph will go below this line of minus 1.25 and we believe that this result is sharp in the following sense in that this graph will actually oscillate between two values this green line and the red line uh, sorry this red line and the green line the red line is our upper bound uh, so our upper bound that we that, that we get from the previous slide so this means that this result is for all, for, all, for all practical purposes, for almost all the time, it will be sharp. But sometimes you can get lucky. We, uh, there, there might be some number theoretic reasons where, you're, where because your n is like a, maybe like a very close to some irrational numbers, that this number just get much smaller than minus five over four. Unfortunately, we still don't know exactly what is this value or even if this green line exists. And if anybody has any good ideas or have any good uh, simulations, or maybe like some better simulations that allow us to get like what exactly is this number, I'll be very interested to talk to you. I'll be interested to discuss about it. Okay. So you have an experimental proof, kind of. Uh, kind of, yes. <laughs> so yeah, for that, uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, now the question is that, why is it that we can do this thing for Catalan poset and not for other poset? Well, the reason is that because we changed our strategy a little bit. So before you remember that on, we, only, uh, we only allow y to move, right? We only optimize over y. X is fixed. The new strategy is that now you, now you optimize for both. Optimize for y and optimize for x. In particular, that means that let yx is that for every fixed choice x, yx is the optimal one. 
is the one that let this probability to be as small as possible. Okay. And now is again the experimental proof is that uh, we actually go and construct this thing. We showed uh, you can uh, we, we can show that this state actually looks like semicircle. Oh, uh, let me say that the horizontal axis here, this is the choice of X. So this is the location of X in the first row. The vertical axis is the, is the distance between X and Y, between X and the optimal choice for Y. And we can show that this thing, the height of this thing is of order square of N, the shape is semicircle. That part is not surprising. This part can be explained by things on probability. The surprising part is that, do you see this zigzag pattern over here? This pattern does not, again, this pattern does not disappear as n grows larger and larger. This pattern stays there. And that pattern, uh, this is because we are dealing with discrete mathematics. We are dealing with discrete stuff. We are not dealing with continuous stuff. That's why this pattern stays. And that pattern actually really help us. It's the thing that allow us to go from square root of n to n to the power of five, minus one point two five. Because of the following, again, this is again, uh, the horizontal axis is again, uh, the, location of the, the location of x. The vertical axis is now the value of the sorting probability. And you see that almost all the time, this value is around square root of n, one over square root of n, which is what is predicted by the Nagelsmann -Nagel formula, what is predicted by the Hannah law. However, because of the zigzag, you can actually get lucky. And sometimes if you're very, very lucky, this thing got pushed down all the way to be something very small. So we first noticed this by doing experiments, by running computer simulations. And after we see that, oh, seems like this is not a coincidence, seems like this keep happening. So we, we do some argument, we do some uh, calculations. We finally managed to pinpoint more or less where this location is and where is the value. And that is how we get this constant n to the power of minus 1.25. Any questions so far? No? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, let me actually make something very important is that why, why is it that we can do this and not for all general concepts? The reason is actually because uh, we are actually not using Nagose formula. Uh, we are actually not using Nagose formula to get this constant n to the power minus 1.25. Is because the Catalan process is simple enough that we can do direct, even uh, even more direct calculations. We don't need to do any approximation anymore. We believe that the same result can apply to all young diagrams. Uh, let me see. And we should see that the delta, we believe that at least delta p. Uh, wait, sorry, my delta p should be less than something like c over n. C over n for all uh, C over n for all process. Uh, sorry, for all young diagrams. It's just that we don't have a uh, good enough technical tools from, uh, to actually do it. That the calculation quickly get getting very very complicated. Okay. okay. So in conclusion, we can show that uh, uh, for many young for young diagrams, that these numbers actually goes to zero as n goes to infinity. However. There is no reason to expect that this result is special to young diagram. In fact, we believe this applies to a much more bigger, fa uh, bigger family of process. It's just that, uh, in fact, our technique, I believe that it can apply, it can possibly apply to some of these uh, other examples, which is the k-dimensional young diagrams and periodic process. So for the, for the student audience, if anybody here is interested, maybe you've run some research problem, and you think that you might have, uh, you might be interested in working on this, please let me know after the talk. Okay. Uh, k dimensional Young diagram, you mean that the shape is k dimensional, is it opposed to two dimensional? For example, uh, solid, for k plus three, the solid Young diagrams? It's a, so, yeah, exactly. It's a solid Young diagrams. So you're, and, giving uh, a, yes. you're, giving a, you're giving a plane partition and you fill it up with, like you usually do. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. There's the there's the k-dimensional diagrams. So that's the sorry the three-dimensional one, and the k-dimensional in general is yeah, the same the same idea, and yeah that is that will be the strategy might still work. 
but we might chase from now say formula to some other formula that might actually allow us to do the same to same strategy, the same strategy. Okay. And yes. And I think that is a good time to actually to stop now. So thank you very much for your attention. Please let's thank Professor John for the great talk. Thank you. Yeah, we have time for questions. I have a question. It's really fascinating how you get something so explicit and sharp for two rows. Can you extend your message at least for three rows? Ah, for three rows, that's a good question. Uh, let me go. Most likely, yes. I Yes, for three rows, I think we can do it. And the constant might not be 1.25 anymore. It will be something a bit smaller, but definitely not one. So that one plus epsilon, yeah. But yes, I believe that can be done. Actually, that is actually, that's actually, yeah, that's actually a good research project, actually. Thank you. Thanks for, thanks for the very good question and very good ideas. Any other questions? Is the constant uh, minus five fourths and, and whatever you would get, say, in the three row case, re some related to some universality constant that comes from, you know, the asymptotics of counting, say, planar maps or something like this? Um, is that is a good question. Yeah, so I think that, uh, yes, I think so. I believe that this constant should come from, uh, actually come from random walk. Uh, so if you, that means that, uh, so in the random walk, there's this thing called the uh, recurrence dimension, which is the dimension when, uh, how to say that, when the random walk starts to, you know, like, like go from between recurrence and transients. And we believe that's, that's related to that constant. Exactly the relation we have not figured it out yet. That's because, uh, because the path calculations get, very very tricky soon very tricky very very quickly but yes i think something like that so something like that should be true i hope they answer your question yes thank you are there any more questions for sui Hong? what about uh the sorting, okay, the sorting probability delta for rooted trees. Do uh, If I take a rooted tree and I think of that as a post set, do you know what delta is in, this, in that case? Ah, mm, for rooted trees, it will be also be very close to zero, depend, uh, as your, if your tree grows larger and larger. I do not know exactly the value, but I need, I need to check it. But yes, I think it is, I think it's probably, I think it was like, it's no. Yes. I think because that, that's like the next thing you want. Uh, the, yeah, because that's the thing that you probably can do it because uh, I presume it's because a rooted tree is also has a uh, connection to the, it also can be counted by the full length formula. Yes, that's right. Yeah, so the same arguments should possibly hold. And yeah, I think that is probably also will give you the same idea. Same except, except you don't have a, a version of skew that, I mean, I, I don't know if, if a, a skew, if, the mm -hmm. skew dry, if there's a kind of skew diagram formula like the Naruza formula in the tree case? Uh, I, most like, uh, like uh, if it's published or not, I don't know, but probably it's actually, probably it can be done and maybe it's even easier. Huh? Because actually to prove, so to go to prove the hook link formula and to prove the, the rooted tree version, the rooted tree is much easier. So presumably the same, I, the same thing also except the Naruza formula, and that you can do this, do everything I do everything we did for also for the rooted tree. Yes, that's a good idea. Thank you so much for for the good question for the great questions. Can, can I ask one more? <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Yes, really, this um, is the former part of this talk. Uh, Robert, uh, uh, please stop recording. But people are welcome to stay and ask more questions. Thank you. Bye.